Good morning, and welcome to the museum's Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. In each episode, we explore a different aspect of Holocaust history and its connections to, its influence on, its relevance to our world today. Here in the United States, February is Black History Month, and to commemorate this special month, we will honor today Black Americans who served in the United States military during World War II and helped to defeat Nazi Germany. Their service is even more remarkable when viewed against the backdrop of racism and persecution that they faced at home, even while fighting for their country abroad. This history has often been buried or overlooked, and we hope to shed some light on it and its intersection with Holocaust history in today's program. I'm very pleased to be joined by two special guests today to help bring this chapter to life. First, Deneen Brown is an award-winning journalist for the Washington Post and an associate professor in the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Hi there, Deneen. Hello. Hello, good morning. It's great to be here. So glad you're here. And Lynn Williams is a longtime friend and colleague who is an educational program consultant to the museum. So good to see you, Lynn. Good to see you too, and good morning to both of you and our guests. During today's program, please send your questions for Deneen and Lynn by posting them in the comments section, and we'll get to as many of them during the course of the live show as we have time for. But Lynn, let's begin with you and setting the scene. Uh, we have a lot of international viewers of this program, maybe less familiar with the American context. Tell us about some of the pressures that average Americans were grappling with in the 30s and 40s, and more specifically, the way that racism influenced uh, the country at that time. Well, in order to understand this period, I think I'm going to focus on three major realities. The first one was that the United States was in the throes in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, there were bread lines, and here you see this is a um, migrant workers that are huddled in this tent um, during the Great Depression. Uh, the second was that we were coming out of about 12 years away from World War I, and Americans were not interested in foreign engagements. They really wished to be isolationists and um, had did not have the stomach for another entanglement. And the third really is the intolerance in general. There was animosity against um, Jews, very pervasive against foreigners, um, and um, racism, you know, was also at play and rampant all over the country. We think of the South, but this is a restaurant in Ohio, the picture that you're seeing in front of you, and uh, white trade only. So that's a prevalent message of the time. There were limited opportunities for Black people. Um, much of the country was still segregated, so schools and um, public transportation, um, bathrooms, everything was basically segregated, not only in the South, but much of it in the North. And then finally, um, there was violence. There was someone lynched in the South perhaps every day. These are students at Howard University in Washington, DC. It's a historically black university that are protesting what are they protesting? They're protesting in favor of a national anti-lynching law that it be passed, which is very strange since lynching is, is definitely murder. And for people who may not be familiar with the term lynching, uh, they will have seen ropes hanging around nooses, hanging around uh, the necks of those Howard University students. It was mob violence where typically um, a person, an African-American person, would be surrounded by a racist mob, hung up and lynched. But I want to emphasize that the target here is not just the, uh, the victim directly of the murder, but the entire community. These were crimes designed to intimidate and create a cult, an atmosphere of terror and fear. Mm -hmm. So against this backdrop, I'd like to turn to you, Deneen, uh, where we can focus on how this um, scene that Lynn has just described intersects with our history here at the Holocaust Museum. How did racism impact Black Americans who joined the military as the U.S. entered the war? I know you've done some reporting in this area. Yes, again, good morning. Um, more than 1.2 million Black men and women uh, enlisted 
um, in the military uh, to help fight in Europe. Here you see a photo of some of the black men who um, fought overseas in Europe during World War II. This is, and uh, here's a photo of some of the, the black women who served in Europe. Black Americans in the military dur during World War II faced racism and discrimination, really horrible treatment in Europe, both by uh, white American soldiers and sometimes by Europeans. The troops were segregated by race. They lived in often lived in segregated barracks. Many were relegated to menial duties. Some veterans that I talked to during my reporting told me that um, black soldiers were often ill-treated and that sometimes the German prisoners were actually treated better than the black American soldiers. The German prisoners sometimes had more rights and privileges given to them than black American soldiers. It's really a very jarring scene to imagine. Um, I'd like to pause for a moment to greet our, our viewers who are watching us from all around the country. <clears throat> Good morning to you. Uh, thank you for joining us from Omaha, Nebraska, Boynton Beach, Florida, Farmington, Connecticut, uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, not far away in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and Centerville, Minnesota, and also good morning to you in Birmingham, Alabama. We'd also like to welcome our international viewers, whatever the time of day is there, in Berlin, London, Nicaragua, in the city of Puglia in Italy, Barcelona, Quito, Ecuador, in Brazil, Argentina, Peru, and Tanzania. We are so glad to have so many of you watching. So Lynn, Deneen has described the ways that the US military was segregated, uh, was uh, unjust, but let's make this more personal. You knew one of these black soldiers um, later in his life. Please tell us about Dr. Leon Bass and specifically his experience as a black soldier during his training, even before deployment. I had the privilege of really spending a great amount of time with Dr. Bass because he volunteered and spoke to young people from all over um, at the museum. This is a picture of Dr. Bass in his uniform when he was a sergeant. And uh, he grew up in 19, he was born in 1925 and grew up in Philadelphia. His uh, his parents were part of that great migration that was happening throughout this period where Blacks are moving up north into cities and changing the landscape of cities in, uh, in, in many large cities. He went to an all black school, but it was an excellent school and he excelled in his studies. So um, as soon as he finished high school, he volunteered. World War II had started and he passionately volunteered for the army in 43. And he went into the army as a sergeant. And as he put as he put it, it was really a shock to his system because he's trained in Georgia. So the minute he hits Georgia, whether he is in uniform or not, he's faced with segregated everything. And he's told to, you know, you can't use this um, water fountain. You've got to move to, uh, to, you know, the colored only water fountain. And so he experiences racism in the South in a very different way and codified as to local law. Uh, many of the many of those that enlisted and volunteered were, you know, highly skilled, very smart, and they knew they had to be, you know, better in order to excel in anything, and especially in the military. When you say better, you mean better than their um, white peers? Yes, they had to be more dedicated. They had to be, um, you know, they had to demonstrate that over demonstrate how smart they were. They really had to have um, achieved uh, and be ready to fight for uh, their place to just get equal footing. So what was Sergeant Bass's assignment in Europe and how did he come to feel about the sacrifices that he was making? Well, he was, he joined the 183rd um, engineer combat battalion and it's an all black unit. They usually had um, a white commanding officer, whether they were with each unit or not, but and he drove tanks, took part in building roads as the engineer battalions did, clearing the way for soldiers. He was took part in the Battle of the Bulge and 
that was the um, first time where he really saw death and bodies as a soldier at this young age of both strangers and people he knew. And um, so that was, that was, you know, really impactful on his life. We have a comment from a viewer named Richard. Richard writes in, I often wonder why these men volunteered because today more than ever, we know they were often treated poorly by their fellow soldiers. I think as a group, they had more pride. And uh, Richard's comment actually uh, leads in very nicely to a clip we have directly from Dr. Bass describing this in 1988, where he discusses the impact that seeing a dead soldier had on him while he was serving. Let's hear how he described it. And I remember another time I saw someone I didn't know. He happened to be white, He's about my age, and he was on the ground and his eyes were wide open, they were blue. He had blonde hair and his hands were frozen above him, his body because the weather was so cold, he had been alongside the road for a while. And I looked down into those eyes and I realized that I could end up just like that. And that's when I began to question my wisdom for having <laughs> joined the army. And uh, I wanted to know why I was there. What the heck am I doing here when I can't get a drink of water, when I can't ride on a bus, when I can't eat in a restaurant. And here I am putting my life on the line fighting for rights and privileges that I'm denied. Yeah, and it's important to remember that that, that was a young man, a young, no, to me, a child at the time, but um, it's shaping his perspective of the world. And Sergeant Bass was not alone in seeing this um, disjuncture. Uh, back home, momentum was building for Black Americans to fight racism at home while simultaneously fighting for their country abroad. Lynn, could you tell us a bit about what came to be known as the Double V campaign? Yes, because Black Americans remained conflicted. And um, the Double V campaign came about in response to a letter that was written in 1942 to uh, the Pittsburgh Courier. It was a black newspaper at the time. And this is one of you know the publication headlines. Should I sacrifice to live half American? Well, that's a question that was really asked consistently in the black community. Um, and uh, the letter was um, written by James Thompson. This you see in that campaign lasted throughout the war and it certainly affected those who fought. Here are soldiers, um, uh, veterans from, from uh, in 1947 that are still embracing the double V. It's victory um, uh, at home as well as overseas and abroad with the Axis powers. So they wanna fight hate on both fronts and discrimination. And when you're describing um, media outlets, newspapers like The Courier, the mm -hmm. black press was really vibrant, diverse at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading that the circulation, the official circulation of The Courier, the Pittsburgh Courier then was about a quarter of a million, mm -hmm. but that represented surely only a fraction of the number of readers. Um, copies of newspapers would have been passed uh, from friend to friend, um, you know, within restaurants, barbershops, families, neighbors. Mm -hmm. So many, many more people were reading about this mm -hmm. debate. Yes. Um, Deneen, before I turn back to you, I want to offer some special thanks to partners and friends who helped us prepare for today's episode, um, particularly to thank the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands for their assistance, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, and also an author named Joe Wilson, who wrote a book about the 784th Tank Battalion that we'll learn about a little more in a moment uh, for the insights and information that they shared with us. We are grateful for your support. Deneen, let's put another face, another personality uh, to these experiences. Just last year, you interviewed a gentleman named Dr. James Baldwin. Um, tell us about Dr. Baldwin and his path to military service. Yes. Dr. James Baldwin, he was born in 1924 in North Carolina. We see a, um, a picture of him there as a young man. Um, in North Carolina, um, he attends segregated schools. He's living in a segregated society, segregated by race. We know that lynchings were rampant and, and uh, across the country then. Um, 
he graduates from high school with honors and he goes off to college. After six months in college, he decides to enlist in the army. And he, uh, he is in that 784th tank battalion, right? Which yes. is one of so only three. Go ahead, please. James Baldwin is assigned to the 784th tank battalion. Um, this is one of, one of three all black fighting units. Um, its motto was, it will be done. It was a segregated unit that had an excellent combat record. According to my research, um, I read that the 784th Tank Battalion proved, proved to be one of the finest, um, one of the finest uh, fighting forces uh, uh, in, the, in the American arsenal. As Lynn was saying, many of these men um, felt that they needed to prove themselves, prove that they were better than their colleagues, prove that they were fierce fighters. And this 784th Tank Battalion, which uh, Dr. James Baldwin was a member of, um, made valiant uh, uh, efforts in Europe and proved to be a fierce fighting unit. And before being deployed uh, to the European theater, um, he was promoted to the rank of corporal. Um, so looking back, what did Corporal Baldwin encounter when he arrived to Europe? So when, when they were shipped uh, to Europe, uh, they were hit hard. Um, um, the 784th uh, Tank Battalion arrives in England, it travels to France, and then it travels to the Netherlands. Um, black soldiers, again, um, in Europe, they face racism, but they're also facing a really warm reception from Europeans um, as they travel through these towns um, fighting the Germans. Here we see a photo of Corporal James Baldwin. Um, I think the photo is taken in 1945. Um, somewhere in Germany, he told me he wasn't quite sure which town he was in Germany when this photo was taken. And what about his interactions with uh, locals, with civilians? So many of those uh, black American soldiers, when they rolled through these towns, they were greeted with warm um, receptions from civilians. Um, we see here that um, uh, a black American soldier is helping a little girl with her doll off a truck. Um, that that may have been in the Netherlands, one of the towns in the Netherlands. Again, we see here um, some young people in the Netherlands posing for a photo with black American soldiers. Lynn, uh, we have a couple of questions coming in from viewers that I'd like to pose to you. Um, two, uh, one from a woman named Kimberly is asking if you could speak a little bit about uh, the experience of black American soldiers upon their return to the US after the war. And as a subset of that, uh, Doreen writes to ask, were black Americans able to access the post-war GI Bill benefits for college and mortgages uh, as white veterans were? Could you speak to that a little, please? Yeah, I think they're both excellent questions. Uh, yes, you can imagine, we know how celebratory it was for um, victory in World War II and white soldiers certainly, you know, were um, applauded and, and praised. It wasn't quite the same for black soldiers when they came home. Um, uh, their, the discrimination not only continued, but um, they worked if, in terms of the GI Bill. Uh, for many of them were denied at the access that was given to other soldiers, to the mortgages and um, uh, the college benefits. So yeah, it was greatly diminished. Um, and the experience, even taking it further, and I think Janine can speak more to this, there was violence. These soldiers came home proud, armed, trained, and enjoyed wearing their uniform, which cost many of them um, as they walked and returned to their communities. 
And it's not just a question of personal dignity. It had very, very real and uh, dangerous consequences and dangers. Um, Deneen, could you give us one example of that, what happened to a, a returning sergeant soon after his return to America? Sure. Um, I want to talk about Sergeant Isaac Woodard. Um, he, in 1946, he was um, discharged from, from the Army with honors. He's a decorated um, soldier who fought the Nazis in Europe. He returns to the United States and he's again discharged with honor from the army. He takes a bus south, heading home to South Carolina. Um, on the way home on the bus, he asks the bus driver whether he could stop to use the restroom. Um, there was a policy for bus drivers to allow passengers to take a bathroom break. Um, as um, Lynn pointed out, many of the soldiers who came back uh, after having fought uh, for democracy in Europe were expecting to be treated with some sense of dignity here in the United States, to be treated with honor, to be treated with respect, to be treated as equals. Um, so Isaac, uh, Sergeant Isaac Wood Woodard is on this bus traveling south. Uh, the bus driver does not want to stop to allow him to use the restroom. Um, there, there may have been um, somewhat of a, you know, a, a confrontation on the bus, verbal confrontation on the bus. We're not quite sure what happened, but at the next town, the bus driver stops, he calls the police, the police chief in the South Carolina town greets the bus. He pulls Sergeant Woodard off the bus. And again, this is a decorated soldier. Pulls him off the bus. He beats him. And then he takes his nightstick and he jams his nightstick into Sergeant Woodard's eyes, gouging his eyes out. Um, here we see a photo of Sergeant Woodard with his mother, he's blinded, there are patches over his eyes. Um, this beating of Sergeant Woodard makes national headlines and President Harry Truman hears about this beating. Um, many people may know or may not know that uh, President Truman had a soft, Spartan, soft spot in his heart for veterans uh, when he sees this photo of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, he's just um, taken aback. I mean, it's just a horrible sight. This uh, beating and the photo eventually leads President Truman to desegregate uh, the, arm, uh, the military and also desegregate the federal workforce. It's... Um beyond troubling to hear this kind of story. It's terrifying and um, impossible to really imagine the feeling that must have been to know for these soldiers, you've put your life on the line, you're coming back, and the idea that you feel proud of that service makes people wanna kill you for it. To have that patriotism trampled on must have been so profoundly disillusioning, um, you know, negating the promise that this service might have represented as an, an opportunity. Um, we have a viewer comment, an audience comment from a man named Peter. He writes in that uh, even Jackie Robinson, an officer mm -hmm. from the 761st Tank Battalion, was pulled off a bus in Killeen, Texas, for not moving to the back of the bus. Uh, while he was enduring a court martial, his unit was called up to fight for General Patton. Robinson was acquitted, but never got to fight with his legendary unit. So um, these are not isolated, isolated incidents. Um, Lynn, I'd like to return to, to Dr. Leon Bass because he spent many years not talking about what he had seen in Europe, especially in um, concentration camps that had recently been liberated. Thanks and recognition only came later in his life when he began to publicly discuss the atrocities he had seen. Could you tell us a bit about Dr. Bass's personal trajectory, please? Yes, Dr. You know, as Sergeant, Sergeant Bass was only 20 years old when he first encountered Buchenwald and, uh, you know, those Holocaust victims uh, that he saw at that camp in April 1945. And he kept that in. It certainly had a profound effect. 
But like many survivors, it took him 20 or 25 years to find his voice. And it happened when he, as a teacher, he's an educator, he's become a you know, doctor of education, he's principal of a school, and he's in um, his class and a Holocaust survivor is speaking, his students are you know, listening, but not as intently, and he then begins to share his story. And it's there where he really found the importance of him as a witness. And from then on, it became his mission uh, to share his observations and insights with students all over and uh, all over the United States and Canada. And let's hear him once again describe in his own words um, what this meant to him and what he took away from it. It's not a black problem, it's not a white problem, it's a human problem. And we've got to face it. And as Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a loss of justice everywhere, you see. Where's that effect? And it's true, what affects you affects me. Your pain has to be my pain, my pain has to be your pain. I know it's been 40 some years, but that doesn't make it go away. It only makes us become more aware that we today have to do something that to stop that which created the final solution. And that something is racism. Really, racism is at the root of all of this. Under that umbrella comes bigotry and prejudice and discrimination, and unemployment, people who are unemployable, uh, large institutions filled with those who are drug addicts and those who are criminals, all because somehow we have come to grips with that institution of call racism. And we have to because we see the ultimate of racism, which was what I saw at Buchenwald. And they all, yeah, that ultimate consequence, he really understood what the consequence was for not finding his voice, not actively fighting against, um, you know, this kind of hatred and racism. And it also put him in touch with um, survivors from all over. And one of those survivors, Robert Weissman, in 1991 uh, in Vancouver, they met. This is a picture of Robert Weissman as a teenager. And uh, they met in the speaking engagement when Robert remembered clearly, and here they are, the two of them together, remembered clearly meeting, seeing, not meeting, but seeing Leon Bass at Buchenwald uh, in that April. And he looked up, he said it was the first black person I'd ever seen. And I looked up and I realized you, or thought you are my Messiah. And um, many years later, um, as they, as he met the grandchildren of another survivor, Yosef Flom, uh, who referred um, to Leon to uh, Dr. Bass and the members of his unit as Black Angels. So certainly their presence had a great impact on those that, on the survivors, those that he helped. And that for many, we've heard that for many of these survivors, this was the first Black person that they had ever seen. And for them, this was the face of America. This was the face of a nation that had fought for their freedom. We're having many audience comments, <clears throat> excuse me, coming in about the impact that Dr. Leon Bass had when he spoke about his experiences because he spoke far and wide. Mm -hmm. um, just to read one, Karen writes to say that Dr. Bass spoke at an event that I brought my students to. His impact on them was amazing. Mm -hmm. And another woman writes, Adele writes that Dr. Leon Bass um, liberated my father at Buchenwald concentration camp. My dad had the chance to speak with him years ago at an event at Rutgers College. So there's someone who, you know, might not be alive if not for the efforts of soldiers like Dr. Bass. Deneen, how about Dr. Baldwin, who I know you've had the chance to meet and talk to personally. Has he been recognized for his service and bravery? And how did you cross paths with him? So yes, uh, Dr. James Bald Baldwin received two bronze stars in 1946 and many other honors and awards. Last February, I went to the embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands where they were honoring uh, black American soldiers on the 75th anniversary of uh, the defeat of, of the Germans and, and these occupied towns. 
Here's a photo that I took of Dr. James Baldwin with uh, officials at the Embassy of the Netherlands. They have just uh, given him a certificate of appreciation for his service and um, in the 784th Tank Battalion, which uh, rolled through uh, uh, towns in France and, and, and the Netherlands fighting the Germans. Um, during this event, I was just, it was really uh, amazing to hear the story, the story told by Dr. James Baldwin of his service. Uh, you could hear a pen drop in the audit auditorium as Dr. Baldwin told about um, rolling through these towns in the Netherlands and, and fighting the Germans. I had a chance to interview Dr. Baldwin after the event and again, he told me his story of, uh, of fighting the Germans. Um, he told me that he, he fired an 81 millimeter mortar gun at Nazi troops, uh, which had a stranglehold on Holland during the war. Um, here's a quote that I, I really loved from my interview with him. He says, we took 23 cities in three days. We were really moving. We were taking the cities, meaning killing Germans and running them out. We came in and we freed them, we liberated them. To know I had a role in the liberation of Holland means a lot. So again, the Embassy of the Netherlands honored Baldwin and hundreds of other black soldiers uh, as part of their commemoration of the 75th anniversary of what they called the liberation. Freeing them from German occupation and oppression. And I hope you'll both have a chance to go and look at the lively discussion that's happening in the comment section of this show. We're getting audience reflections also about Dr. James Baldwin, uh, including two, one from a viewer named Nadine, who says that he is 96 years old and still brilliant and that she plans to share this program on Facebook. And someone else writing in to say that uh, James Baldwin attended, attended Fayetteville State University, which is another historically black university, and that he is celebrated by the students and alumni there. So certainly um, a hero. Um, I'm also struck looking at these pictures of uh, then Corporal Baldwin in Europe and then later at the embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, thinking these are people whose lives otherwise would never have intersected, um, how the forces of history brought them together in powerful and moving ways. In the last minutes that we have left, I'd like to ask you both a kind of more reflective question. Uh, here we are more than 75 years after the Holocaust, of, you know, a violent eruption of racism, and we are still grappling with the forces of bigotry and hate. What messages do you hope that viewers will take away from these complex stories of true American heroes? And Lynn, let's start with you. Yes. You know, one thing is that certainly the struggle still continues for uh, not only black people, but for all Americans. And understanding history is exceedingly important because history shapes us. And um, personally and nationally, it shapes us. And so I would say that for me, this commitment to understanding where we've come from and why we sit where we sit today is everyone's mission. And then going forward, knowing is Leon Bass who found his, uh, Dr. Bass who found his voice, understood that what each of us does matters. Deneen? Yeah, um, I'd like to say that you know, racism is truly an ugly evil um, in this world, and it's important that we fight racism. I often say that it's important that um, that people educate themselves about racism. Um, race is a social construct. It is. It is a. It's a term that's invented by a society to divide us by our skin color. What I believe is that we're all human. We're all part of one race, the human race. We're just walking around here in different packages, but we truly are part of one race of people. And it's important that we 
We see each other just as humans. When you cut me, I bleed. I think if we are able to overcome this racial divide um, that society has tried to construct to divide us, we will find, uh, I think we'll, we'll find a better world and the world will be better as a result of that. Well, I wanna thank you both very much for helping, uh, we hope to introduce some of our audience members to history they may never have heard of before and to help us to honor even belatedly uh, these men and women who were charting very, very difficult waters at a time of competing pressures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to close with a comment from a viewer named Peggy. Peggy writes that white history has been every day for many years spoken about, textbooks written about, while black history was excluded. Celebrating the contributions of black soldiers is righting a wrong, giving true history and allowing them to tell their stories. This is about being better human beings. And Peggy, I'm sure we all are in agreement with you. We hope that you will come back to the museum's website to see in their own words again, um, more firsthand testimony from African-American soldiers who fought for the US during the war. We also hope that you will join us for our next program, which will take place on Wednesday, March 10th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time here in the United States. The show will be about women in World War II, the spies they never saw coming, in which we will discuss female spies during the war who exploited the low expectations of women by using those to camouflage their espionage on behalf of the allies. Until then, from wherever you're watching, please be safe and be well. Bye-bye.